bloody hell. This place is weird. Don't get me wrong, it's fascinating too. Such an abundance of underground flora is completely unheard of. And because so many of the plants here are bioluminescent, the whole forest has an eerie beauty to it. That's just it, though. Eerie is the operative word. I've been holding my rifle so tightly since we got here that I swear I've left dents in the grip. We should have gone back to the island. People know us there. They might have preferred help and supplies. Rockwell didn't want to hear it, though. And I wasn't about to let him come here alone. You can't surprise me anymore, life, I said. After wyverns, golems, and giant sandworms, I'm ready for anything. What about flying squid bat murder monsters, life replied. Well, that is mildly surprising, I conceded. By which I mean, I shot and cursed at those things all afternoon. At least when I wasn't running from them. Thankfully, after thinning their numbers a little, they decided that Rockwell and I weren't worth the trouble. Let's hope they don't change their minds. I'm not sure I have enough ammunition left to fend them off again. And yes, I know that FSBMM isn't the most scientific of monikers, but I'm bloody upset with them right now, so that's what I'm calling them. Along with some other names I'd rather not write down. While I can't say I'm enamoured with this station's wildlife, I'm certainly grateful for its abundance of natural resources, particularly water. The permeability of the rocks here is astounding. The cavern walls are wet with condensation, and the floor is littered with pools of water. After all that time in the desert, this is one change I can welcome with open arms. Thank God for hydration. I don't mean that just for my own sake, either. Rockwell seems... distracted. The other day, I had to keep him from walking headlong into a poisonous mushroom. He wouldn't fare well in a harsher environment. Then again, at his age, I'm sure I'd lose a step, too. There's no mistaking it. That was a giant, armoured mole rat. Thankfully, it wasn't aggressive, so I was able to get a good look at it. Its appearance made me realise something that I'd taken for granted. Every creature I've encountered has some basis on either a known species or human legend. Golems and wyverns never existed on Earth, but humans did write stories about them. Even the FSBMMs, still cross with them, appeared to be a pastiche of known fauna. What does that mean? Are the curators of these stations human? Do they merely possess extensive knowledge of humans, or am I grasping at straws? I can't say, but it's worth pondering. The FSBMMs returned, and I was right. I didn't have the firepower to fight them. Luckily, someone else did. It was incredible. I've never seen a human move that fast. One second, I'm a dead woman, and the next, there's someone in glowing silver armour tearing through those creatures like they were dodos. One got punched so hard, it skipped off the cavern floor. As if a superhuman saviour wasn't shocking enough, when they lifted their visor, I found a familiar face. It was Mei Yin. It took me a good minute to form a sentence after that. I must have looked like a complete dipstick because I swear she almost laughed. <laughs> At least I'm a living dipstick. And with her around, I just might stay that way. What's the saying, uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder? On the island, I wasn't sure where I stood with Mei Yin. But now we've been catching up like best mates. She apologised for sucking me in the face. I learned how she arrived here and that she got her new scar while battling Nerva to the death. You know, best mate things. She also introduced us to some of her new allies at her camp. And here's where it gets loony. They're from the future. Well, my future, anyway. It all fits, doesn't it? I never met anyone from my future before, but Mayin and Rockwell are from my past, and the technology here is beyond anything from my present. Clearly, the current year is far beyond 2008. But by how much? The journey to the village was a bit tricky. Since Rockwell and I lacked the high-tech armor the others wear, they had to help us along with rope ladders and zip lines. We made it eventually, though. And it's quite the sight. 
The technology this tribe uses is incredible, although Rockwell was far more intrigued by it than I was. Mayin's friend, Diana, gave us the grand tour, and he pelted her with questions the whole time. Fortunately, Diana just smiled and answered his questions patiently. Apparently, she was a pilot in her own time, which is the same era her fellow villagers are from. That there are so many people from one time period on one station seems unusual. I wonder what it means. I have to convince them to stop. There's no way the station will allow this. This place would never allow anyone to master it. If it weren't for Raya's warning, I'd be ecstatic about what they were creating. A gateway that can help us escape the station and reach the planet below? It's brilliant. But the obelisks will kill everyone here before we can complete it. Just like they destroyed the village Raya told me about. I'm sure of it. <sighs> Bloody hell, I'm gonna look like an absolute madwoman. I've barely settled in here and I'm already coming to them with doomsday prophecies. I'll need to convince Mei Yin and Diana first. They're my best bet. The tribe's leadership was surprisingly receptive to my ideas, but still a bit skeptical. Apparently, they've already fiddled with one of the obelisks, and even damaged this station's control center. So while they believed my account of what happened in the desert, they think the threat is already contained. Thankfully, Diana convinced them to lend me a small team to inspect the obelisk, just in case. Better than nothing, at least. However, on this station, getting to an obelisk is something of a risky proposition. To reach them, we'll need to make a trip to the surface, which even Mei Yin says is dangerous. That means before I go, I'll need to get a crash course on that armor. My time in the desert may have given me some skill with firearms and helped me get fit, despite failing to give me washboard abs, much to my chagrin, but I'm still no soldier. That was evident to anyone who saw me flailing around in the training yard these past few days. If it weren't for Mei Yin and Diana, I'd still be crashing my tech armor into rocks or tripping over myself like a drunken dodo. Plus, I always feel less silly when there's someone to laugh at my mistakes along with me. Fortunately, Mei Yin will be accompanying me to the obelisk, so this whole thing won't rest in my unsteady armored hands. <sighs> Thank God. Mei Yin and I set out yesterday alongside a bespectacled computer expert named Santiago. He'll be the one to actually examine the obelisk. He claims that he can hack into its terminal. If it's preparing to unleash a surge of power, as I suspect, then he says that he might be able to reroute it. Rockwell, for his part, is staying behind. He's been aiding the village's scientists in their studies since we arrived and has become rather... engrossed. Every other sentence with him is about that bloody medal he named after himself. It's a bit troubling, but thankfully Diana said she'd look after him. I can't spend time worrying after Rockwell now, though. The fate of that whole village might depend on this expedition. Focus up, Helena. Let's do this. The structure of this space station must be vastly different from the others to allow for these massive caverns. Is that uncommon? Or do many of the stations vary so radically from one another? I've only seen three. For all I know, they could come in all shapes and sizes. Speaking of different, Mei Yin's been fairly talkative since we left, at least for her. She'll still grow quiet sometimes, but instead of trying to burn me to death with the invisible eye lasers, she stares into the distance and idly fiddles with her necklace. I think it depicts a plane or spaceship of some kind. I wonder where she got it. They weren't exaggerating when they said the surface was dangerous. Direct exposure to sunlight during the day will quickly burn a human to a crisp, even in this fancy armor. That means we have to adjust our sleep schedules and wait just below the surface until night falls. When it does, we'll make a mad dash for the obelisk, let Santiago get in as much work as he dares, then run our asses back to safety. Struth. I thought that bloody desert was diabolical, but this tops it for sure. Why couldn't we do something simple? Like flee from a pack of ravenous allosaurs or something? This life I lead, I swear. Santiago's still going over his readings from last night, 
but even without them, it seems clear that the obelisk was behaving oddly. It was pulsing wildly, and the ground beneath it received regular tremors, as if the whole station was on the verge of tearing itself apart. If this obelisk goes off, it could mean Armageddon for every living thing here. Despite this, Santiago is insisting on analysing his readings. The scientist in me is proud of his dedication to hard evidence, but the part of me that would rather not be obliterated by a mysterious high-tech space station really wishes he would hurry the hell up. We shared our findings with the village by radio. Santiago's analysis confirmed what I suspected. The obelisks are highly unstable. They could be days away from reacting. However, Santiago raised a good point. Even if the Gateway Project is shut down, we can't say for sure that it would stabilise the obelisks. It may be too late to dissuade the station from destroying the village. The only way to ensure our survival is to shut down the obelisks themselves. According to Santiago, we can't do that from the obelisks' platforms, but he may be able to manipulate said platforms into teleporting us somewhere we could. Specifically, into the heart of the station itself. It's a huge risk, but it may be the only hope we have. I can't believe it! We actually made it! We're inside the station! There's a platform here that Santiago was able to lock onto. Perhaps it was used while the station was being built. The architecture here is similar to that of the control centre I encountered before. A jagged cavern of metal lit by an unearthly blue glow. There's a constant hum all around us, likely from the power being sent to all areas of the station. Hopefully Santiago is able to find a map on that console he's been messing with. Then all we have to do is find a control room and shut down the obelisks. Simple, right? Right? As we made our way deeper into the station, we passed through a massive chamber. It was so vast that I couldn't see the bottom of it from the bridge we were on. Yet it was packed full. From wall to wall, it was filled with specimen tubes, each containing creatures, fetuses, or eggs. I knew from the holograms that I'd seen on the island's control centre that each station created its own creatures. But I'd never seen where the process actually occurred. There were specimens for every creature that lived on the station, from dinosaurs to huge alien-looking monsters. Oh, I would have loved to get more data from the room's consoles, but, you know... After reading that aloud, I think Mayin was right. That idea really does sound stupid and dangerous. Good call. Ever since I saw those strange holograms in the island's control center, I'd considered this possibility in the back of my mind. But I wasn't prepared to confront it. Not directly. The room was similar to the one with the creatures, if much smaller. Specimen tubes lined the walls in neat rows and columns. But these all held the same species. Homo sapiens. They weren't clones exactly, at least not of each other. Each one was unique, and they were all adults. I suppose I came from somewhere like this too. Designed in that control center, and then created in this factory. Does that mean my memories? They're all transplants? Fake? No, impossible. They're too vivid, too detailed. Maybe, somehow, the station can reach back in time and just... copy someone. That seems unlikely, but I think I'll cling to it. It makes me feel more... real. At least that way, someone actually lived my life. Even if it wasn't me. The human specimen room was hard on everyone. But I think it was the worst for Mei Yin. She's gone completely silent, trudging behind Santiago, acting like an armored zombie. I've tried my best to explain everything and offer my support, but I'm not sure I helped. When I think about it, it's incredible that she's made it this far with her sanity intact. In her time, they were nearly seven centuries away from inventing bloody gunpowder. 
The idea of a machine that creates human beings, and that it created you, would be unfathomable. I hope she's all right, for all our sakes. Seeing her rattled like this makes me feel a lot less safe. <sighs> we finally found it. This has to be the obelisk's control room. Fortunately, the consoles here were similar to the ones in the control center that I used before, so I was able to help Santiago get started. He's been working on it for a while now, muttering and cursing to himself the whole time. <laughs> I can't blame him. This is some baffling shit with... <gasps> no way! He just said he cracked it! It certainly sounded like he did too. There was a loud hum and... Oh. Oh, those are roars. Lots of roars. Time to run then. I'll finish this later. Right as Santiago finished hijacking the obelisk, the station unleashed a horde of creatures in self-defense. So we blasted the controls and ran like hell. Fortunately, Mayan's battle instinct brought her back to reality just in time, and she led the charge through a throng of fangs and claws, while Santiago and I did what we could as we raced to keep up. Even though Santiago had prepared the platform for a quick getaway, it was a close call. I had to pull him through the portal just before it closed. But in the end, we made it. We're covered in guts and still a bit twitchy, but we made it. Struth, what a day. I need a pint and the world's longest nap stat. You'd think I'd be more enthused. We saved the village, I confirmed the true nature of these space stations, and when the Gateway Project is complete, we could actually escape this madness. It's all good news, really. So why am I not thrilled? I tried sketching some of the wildlife we spotted on the way back to the village. But I stopped halfway through. What's the point? In the desert, I told myself it was a form of self-expression. But is it really? If a machine created me to behave in a certain way, am I expressing myself or the will of the machine? <sighs> I really need that pint. Maybe several. We contacted the village to tell them we succeeded. They were a lot more excited than we were. It was quite raucous, actually. Cheering, applause and all that. Enough that Santiago almost dropped the radio right out of his hands. Even Mei Yin cracked a smile at that. She's coming around, if slowly. She just needed a bit of space, I think. I'm starting to come to terms with everything myself, even if my memories are someone else's, or aren't real to begin with. What I've done since I arrived on these stations was my choice. What I do from now on is my choice. That's who Helena Walker is. I think I'm okay with that. We got another call from the village, but this one wasn't celebratory. In fact, best we can tell, it was a distress call. Santiago couldn't quite clear up the signal, but it had that sort of tone. We heard Diana's voice, panicked shouts, and someone mentioned Rockwell. Since then, we've picked up the pace. Hopefully we can make it back in time to help and the situation isn't as dangerous as it sounded. If something were to happen to Rockwell, I can't help but feel like it would be my fault for neglecting him. Damn it all. We've got to hurry. I feared we would be too late, but I never expected the village to suffer such complete devastation. There were bodies and debris everywhere. I nearly wretched at the sight. In the distance, I could just make out the culprit, a colossal violet figure disappearing into the cavern's depths. We raced to find Diana, but by the time we arrived, there was nothing we could do. She died of her wounds in Mayun's arms, somehow still smiling. However, before she passed, she was able to tell us the identity of the monster that had done this. His name was Edmund Rockwell. I can't let Mayun go after Rockwell alone. It's my fault that he was here. He's my responsibility. So why am I huddled here? writing down my thoughts as though I'm too afraid to say them out loud. For weeks we've been besieged by monsters that Rockwell either bent to his will or created himself. But today, Mayan finally grew sick of hiding. She grabbed every weapon and able-bodied beast she could and left to hunt him down alone. I've never seen her like that. 
Even Nerva never made her eyes burn with such hatred. Damn it, she's going to get herself killed and it will be my fault. But how can I shoot him? He's my oldest friend. He helped me when I had no one else. But it's my fault. So I have to try. I have to. I caught up with Mayin and Rockwell among the flowing rivers of magma in the deepest pits of the caverns, where they were already in the midst of battle. By then, Rockwell had grown into a hulking monstrosity, lashing out with flailing tentacles. I needed only one look at that hideous, misshapen face before I made up my mind. I fired until my trigger finger went numb, and together we were able to divide his attention. In his fury, Rockwell created a hole in the cavern floor, and with one final blow, Mayin forced him through it. She nearly fell in herself, but I managed to catch her arm just in time. Thank God I did. If she'd fallen... I... To Sir Edmund Rockwell, know that I choose to remember you, not as the monster you were in your final moments, nor as the secretive, obsessive man you became after I found you in the desert. I should have seen the signs then. If I had, perhaps I wouldn't have to mark this empty grave. This grave is for the man you were, and the man I will remember. He was the man who I'd talk and laugh with over tea long into the night, and the man who'd offer me supplies and a steed without a second thought. He was a scientist, a scholar, and gentlemen. Wherever that man is, I hope he is at peace. Your friend always, Helena Walker. The effects of the monster's rampage still linger. Mei Yin hasn't said a word since we returned. She just stares at that starship necklace, turning it over in her hand again and again. It took an hour of coaxing just to get her to eat. At least the Gateway Project survived, through one miracle or another. Santiago is organizing the survivors into teams to complete it. He thinks they can finish it within two weeks. I suspect I won't be welcome to join them when it activates. Not that I blame them. I brought Rockwell here with me. The people he killed. The destruction he caused. It's on my head. How could I ever ask forgiveness for that? The gateway is set to be complete tomorrow. So last night, I packed up my things and prepared to say my farewells. Santiago protested, but ultimately understood. Mei Yin, on the other hand? I've never seen her break down like that. It caught me completely off guard, as did the part where she wouldn't let go of my wrist. She kept saying she'd already lost too much, and that she couldn't lose anything else. I couldn't just leave after that, even if I could break free of that iron grip, which I doubt I could. So that pretty much settled it. Tomorrow, the gateway will open, and we'll touch down on the planet below. We'll finally escape this mad experiment, and we'll do it together.